Hello and welcome back. So I want you to imagine the scene. Um, it's London, um, it's February, it's the 24th of March and we're meeting with uh, Margaret Heffernan here um, to do a salon. Those of you might have met Mar Margaret before. Um, we've worked with her at Salon London and also um, many times through her incredible books, Willful Blindness, uh, Bigger Prize. And, uh, but this was to celebrate Uncharted, How to Map the Future, a book about the difficulty of predicting the future. And Margaret had really kindly said that we could be the first to do um, a book event with her. We had literally got the books that day and we all came together to hear from Margaret. It was the first time she spoke about her work. It was really nerve wracking for everyone, even Margaret. And it, it landed so well people were so excited to hear about her work of six years and incredible career in looking into how we predict the future we went for a drink afterwards it's one of the great things about salon we often go for a drink margaret likes a monkey shoulder rum if you're ever with her and you want to tell her about your business idea get her a double she might might give you a bit of time um and we were lucky enough to um we were, we were lucky enough um to hear about her novel and um, as we were sitting down, uh, Juliet and I were talking to her about Also, which was six months away at this point. Um, and Margaret was coming to Also to do something on how to change your mind. So um, we're hoping to do that again uh, next time we're all together at Also. And um, so we were talking to her and having this drink. And Margaret said, uh, oh, yeah, Also. Yeah, how's it going? Like, yeah, no, absolutely fine. Really looking forward to it. Very, very busy, you know, uh, getting ready for it. And she said... Yeah, she said, um, you might want to rethink that. Juliet and I are, are kind of like, our jaws hit the ground. It's like, what are you talking about? Remember, this was February. You, wanna re you might want to rethink that. It was like, yeah, Margaret, yeah, yeah. What, what are you talking about? She said, well, um, something's coming, and I think it might change things. I don't want to uh, alarm you, but you might just want to start thinking about how you can deliver also differently. <laughs> Margaret, <laughs> in yes. talking to us about a book about how you can't predict the future, how did right. you predict the future? <laughs> well, I didn't predict the future. Um, I mean, yes, it is kind of astonishing the number of things I talk about in the book which have unfolded over the last two months. But that wasn't about prediction. What I was writing about were the, th the sources of uncertainty that are always, always with us. And I think We're having a, we're having a slight uh, technical problem um, with this. Um, we're so sorry. I think uh, We can have a two-minute break. Yeah, let's have a two-minute break. Okay, I'm so sorry. We're gonna have a two-minute break, and we will come back. Thank you, Margaret. Um, welcome back. Um, I'm so sorry about that. We're with um, Margaret Heffernan, a business psychologist, serial entrepreneur, author of the most incredible range of books, Will for Blindness, uh, Bigger Prize and Uncharted, How to Map the Future, which is one of the things we're talking about today. Um, Margaret, you, you managed to uh, talk about the pandemic um, in your book. In fact, one of your chapters is about a pandemic. How did you manage to predict the future? Well, I didn't. Um, all of my books really are about things that are what I think of as bedrock. They're things that are always, always with us. Um, and the funny thing is, if you write about those kind of persistent things in human life, um, strangely enough, 
events rise to meet it, <laughs> which I think is really what happened with this book. So, I mean, it's amazing because the, the first chapter starts with epidemics, the epidemic of tuberculosis in the 19th century, where really it was reckoned that every single city dweller was infected. And the last chapter in the book, as you say, is about pa pandemics and how we can prepare for them. But I didn't predict them. I, you know, the, the thing that was so interesting to me about epidemics, uh, both in general and tuberculosis specifically, is that this, they're both kind of perfect examples of uncertainty that is always in life. So in the case of TB, lots of people, I mean, almost all city dwellers in the 19th century had TB, but you could have it and not know it. You could, um, it could lie latent and then something could trigger it and kill you. Um, or you might carry it your whole life. So it's a sort of perfect image of uncertainty. And I think that over the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years, we've really fallen prey to a, a myth or an illusion that with enough data and enough super intelligence, we could predict everything, we could know everything, and definitely Silicon Valley aided and abetted that fantasy. And one of the central arguments of my book was, it is a fantasy, uncertainty is always with us, and we need to accept that because otherwise we either become very passive or we start falling for the predictions, the propaganda, which lots of people throw at us all the time. So we need really just to come to terms with the fact that uncertainty is in life, it's not going to leave life, and we need to adapt our way of living to accept that. I mean, I can understand that, you know, certainty is a fantasy, but it's one that we seem quite wedded to. You know, yeah. when you said to Juliet and I, you, you might want to start thinking, and of course, you didn't predict the future. You said, look, there are some scenarios you should prepare for. One of them is also may not happen and you may be um, forced to deliver it delivery, uh, which is exactly what you said. It was no less shocking. We heard Nostradamus predicting the future. <laughs> 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 no, we didn't. But, you know, it's, we were wedded to that idea that also would happen. It was six months away. Who knew what was going to happen? We hadn't seen a pandemic before. Also had always happened. You know, how yeah. can you begin to get your mind round? You know, it, we can say embrace uncertainty. How do you begin to actually embrace uncertainty? Well, I think, <clears throat> I think the first thing is um, to accept that it's there and to start to understand its nature. So what makes epidemics uncertain is that we know that they will keep happening. They have always happened throughout history. Um, there is absolutely no reason to believe that somehow, miraculously, they're going to stop. So once you accept that that part... Start, when will it start? And what will the pathogen be? And you can keep an eye on that stuff, as of course, you know, many agencies around the world do. But I think as an individual, what you can think about is, okay, let's accept that at some point this is going to hit. If it were to hit where I live, which is not certain, but it's possible, what would I want to have? What would I want to have done to be prepared? And a big argument in my book is, you know, let's stop trying to do this minute planning all the time that we've become rather addicted to let's adopt a, what I think of as a preparedness mindset. Let's think about the risks that confront us that are real but ambiguous and make sure that we have in place the resources that we would need to cope with those eventualities. So for example, um, you know, when you take epidemics, there are a whole bunch of things that you want to have in place. First of all, you want to have vaccines. So the Center for Epidemic Preparedness started three years ago developing vaccines for six different diseases that have epidemic potential. We are fortunate because one of those was coronavirus. So we did actually, amazingly enough, start working on this some time ago. Now, you could ask, well, why don't people do that all the time, right? And the truth is that they could and they should, but they don't. 
and they don't because it's absolutely not in the interest of any business model in pharmaceutical companies to invest money in a disease that might happen on a big scale or it might not. That's inefficient R&D. And there's a very big argument in my book against efficiency because in times of uncertainty, efficiency erodes all your margins for action, all your margins for surprise. And so it took the Center for Epidemic Preparedness to start working on these vaccines because the market doesn't provide the incentive to do that. And basically what they said is, you know, there are six big diseases out there with epidemic, epidemic potential. We're gonna start now because we will want to have them ready when the pandemic comes. And of course, had they started earlier, you know, we'd be in a better position. So in an epidemic, you want vaccines, you want really, really good networks of um, relationships between epidem epidemiologists and on the ground local healthcare workers. And you want fantastic relationships with the manufacturers of vaccines. So that's a kind of model of preparedness. You know, in an organization, you might want to make sure that you had large reserves of cash. You would want to have a workforce that had huge degrees of um, trust, generosity, reciprocity, and commitment to your organization. You'd want a lot of people with multiple skills, not just specialists. And you would want a strong sense of solidarity within your culture, because when a crisis comes, you're really going to need that. This is pretty much the opposite of the gig economy, which kind of uses people as widgets and chucks them out when they don't want them which means you're in a position perhaps to reserve cash, but you have no trusted workforce that you could really rely upon. As an individual, I think what it means is that our sense of preparedness can come from definitely not carrying huge amounts of debt, definitely have very, having very strong relationships with lots of different kinds of people that you really care about and that really care about you. Um, these are the things that will keep you going during a crisis in a way that, um, you know, a fancy lifestyle pretty much won't. So it's a completely different mindset. It's not saying we're going to try to predict when this crisis is going to happen, but we're going to ensure that in our lives and in the way that we live, we have and we nurture the sources of resilience. That's really interesting. When you were talking about what you need in your workforce then, that you know, I could really hear um, all the work that went into your book, A Bigger Prize. Yeah. You know, because it was so, so much. And if anyone wants to read uh, A Bigger Prize, it's a fantastic way of, of looking at that element of what you need in a workplace to cope, cope with incredible change. I mean, you did predict that's what the workforce was going to need. Yeah. It has needed it. It's not there. We've, all the cuts from 2008 have meant that we haven't got, you know, organisations yeah. that can really cope. Um, and, I th and I think, you know, if you look at, you know, I remember, I don't know, two weeks before the lockdown going into Boots to get hand sanitizer, you know, they didn't have any. Why didn't they have any? Because they were running their supply chain to maximize efficiency. So they had no backup. They had no backup plan. You know, the NHS has been run for maximal efficiency. You know, fantastic. ICUs have a 93% occupancy rate. You know, so that looks efficient because there's no waste. But the problem is you're completely naked when trouble comes. And I think we have worshipped at the shrine of efficiency for so long. And boy, has it bit us now. And, you know, it's, I mean, I think I've, every book I've ever written, I mean it, right? It's not just a cool idea. No, I know. And yeah. I felt really strongly when I was when I was writing this book that efficiency was sending us in all the wrong directions, both as individuals and as a society. And I am, I have to say, pretty heartened now that the idea of preparedness, which is a central idea in my book, has now gone mainstream. Mm. I mean, it's just everywhere. I was talking to the chairman of a big bank the other day, and he was talking about preparedness. And I said, you know, that's exactly what my book says. And he said, yeah, said kind of sheepishly, I think I was channeling you at the time I said it. <laughs> 
Yeah, but you know, you. But, you know, but I think I think people have got the message that actually running thin, running with thin margins, running with really thin levels of social capital and really thin relationships, you know, this is just a disaster. It's a disaster for people. It's a disaster for organizations. It's a disaster for individuals. Uh, you know, but you say your books have always had, you know, you say you put you put a huge amount of effort and time and research into your into your books. They all have the sense of this is where we are now. This is where we need not to be. Mm. You know, your culture of whistleblowing um, and the benefits yeah. of it with willful blindness, with a bigger prize of how, you know, not working as a as a bigger group is can really, you know, hurt us. And now with Uncharted, how and um, how um, how we can't predict predict the future i mean i remember we did a very very early salon uh, i think when you had you know i think you were on your first draft and you told a room of you know really high-end mm -hmm. business people you know forget it 400 days is the maximum you can you can predict the future now right. you right. know uh, 150 is probably more like it and they you know people just c couldn't believe it no i know <laughs> <laughs> But is it is it tiring being always the person who's going in saying this is how it's going to be and having to win audiences and hearts and minds over? Yeah. Well, it's not tiring <laughs> because, you know, that's the that's the business I'm in and I love doing that's it. That's the joy of it, Margaret. That's the joy of it. But I mean, it's quite interesting because there are a whole bunch of books coming out at the moment about how instead of competing, we all need to collaborate. And I think, well, that's really nice for you guys. You know, some of us wrote about this five years ago. And won a and significant I was prize crazy. for it. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, you guys recognize it. But, you know, almost everybody else thought I was mad or just being sentimental. So, you know, so it's not tiring because I do really believe the stuff that I write and I try to live by it. But I have never had an experience like this book with Uncharted where what I was talking about and the times just connected with such perfect speed. It was just, I mean, it's extraordinary. It's just extraordinary. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I remember you saying about a bigger prize. You know, I feel I've written the biggest suicide um, letter, longest suicide letter of my career in terms of the response it got that we've all got to work together, that there's a bigger prize if we all collaborate, like you say. Um, no. So, you know, so that's an amazing opportunity. And, you know, if, if you want Margaret's book, we are we are um, selling it in our bookstore and we will send it to you. It's a great chance to read it. Um, I think you should buy from us and not them. But that's another issue. We'll talk about that another time. Um, so let's talk about um, predicting the future. I, I'm going to ask you to do what is difficult. And that is to really talk to us about, you know, what are the challenges we're going to face coming out of this? Mm. Um, you know, perhaps saying coming out of this isn't really right because we're not going to leave C19 right. behind. We're going to have to live with it. But, you know, what are the challenges that we're going to face? Yeah, I think the single biggest challenge we're going to face is a mind shift. So, you know, I work with lots of very, very different organizations um, from entrepreneurial startups to gigantic corporations. And what I'm observing is that there are kind of two, two different kinds of mindsets. One is saying, how quickly can we get back to where we were? And the other is saying almost diametrically the opposite, which is it's saying, we're never going to get back to where we were. Um, we need to take what we've got now that works and see what we can make of it. And that, I think is a much more productive way to think about the experience that we're having right now. So for example, you think of um, you know everybody working from home and let's bear in mind, please, the percentage of the workforce that's working at home now is less than 10%, okay? So not everyone. So us, we think we're everyone, right? But those of us who, are, who do jobs where we can do from home, um, people are either saying, well, let's do this forever which I think it'd be absolutely a disaster, or how fast can we go right back to work and pick up where we left off? I think both of those binaries are wrong. I think what we have to do instead is say, okay, you know, this disease could be with us for some time. We might get a vaccine quickly, we might not. Let's not forget, we have no vaccine for AIDS and we've been looking for decades. So vaccines are very difficult things to create. 
So we don't know if, you know, what's going to happen to coronaviruses in our ecosystem. Um, so let's imagine that actually it doesn't go away. Let's think about all the assets and resources we have and think about what are the optimal ways of working where we recognize there's a danger, we recognize there's a need for more safety and distance, but we also recognize that we need social connection and so on. I think the ability to look at where we are now and think, how do we reconfigure the pieces to make something we can all really uh, sustain and enjoy is a much better question to ask than how do we get back to normal? I think the people who keep thinking about how do we get back to normal are going to be incredibly unhappy, be they companies or individuals, because it's not going to be that way. And we have to sort of, you know, let go of the side of the swimming pool, right, and start swimming in the present instead of hanging on to the past. And I don't say this lightly, you know, the other day I was watching, um, I was watching normal people and there's a scene where they're in Italy and in this beautiful Italian oh. villa and this beautiful swimming pool. And in July, I was supposed to be in Italy in a beautiful village with a beautiful swimming pool. And I nearly cried. It's like, oh God, I wish I was there now. And then I thought, yeah, but Margaret, actually what you have to think about is not, can you get there in August? You have to think about how do these experiences make you feel? And with what you have right now, how can you capture that feeling? How do you get to the essence of it? Because it's getting to the essence of it that's going to become sustainable. That's what you have to be creative about. Because, you know, the honest truth is you may never get back to the Italian holidays that you love, or it may take quite a long time, or it, when you get there, it will be different too. So actually just think about where are you now? What do you have now? And what can you make that's joyful with that. And I think, I think in the future, the people who can keep asking that question as weird things hit us as they will, the issue isn't how do we maintain the status quo? The issue is how do we create the status quo that's sustainable today? And I think this is why in all walks of life, real creativity, spontaneity, the ability to improvise is going to be really, really fundamental. And all of those people who liked certainty and like being told exactly what to do and how to do it and where to do it and targets and KPIs and life plans and all that scientific management mumbo jumbo, they're really gonna struggle. So it's gonna be much more important instead of thinking, how do we get back to where we were think about we are where we are. What is the very best we can make with what's in front of us now? And undoubtedly, you know, climate change is going to accelerate that. Even if we get a vaccine for COVID-19, you know, climate change is still there. We're still going to have to be fantastically creative about new ways of living. And it's not, you know, about fake meat. It's just about different attitudes to food, different ways of cooking different things. And I think, you know, not trying to recreate what's lost and obsess over what's lost, but looking forward, you know, that's going to be the mindset that keeps people much healthier, much more robust, and which will lead us, hopefully, if we're fast enough, to create a really sustainable lifestyle and mindset. Um. We love you, Margaret. You know, I think that is a really moving response and so, so, so much to think about. It, it, it really chimes with uh, a couple of things Danny Dawling was saying in the session before you, which is, you know, we've got to look at flights. And I think for the kind of people who come to festivals like this, flights is the real you know, heart stopper, like you say, I've watched those scenes in Normal People. It's a fantastic series. I've wanted to feel that light. We've created a session from Ibiza tomorrow because we want people to just see the light in Ibiza because yeah. it's going to be the best we get probably this year. Yeah. Um, and it is an incredible chance to really rethink, as you say, you know, I, I'm beginning to think about also as a kind of a week long destination holiday that you cycle to, you know, mm. almost like an, an eco tourism thing in a way that just hadn't yeah. considered before, you know, yeah. um, we uh this happened there's a couple of things in in what you said that i want to pick up with one uh, that i think uh, uh, also as well really really love one of them is you really are 
um, and have been, you really are a supporter of looking at the way artists think, aren't you? Mm. And think that we really can learn a lot if we, um, yes. if we really think like artists. And I think artists are having a really tough time at the moment. Yeah. And I wondered if you could just explain why their, their thinking is so useful to us. Yeah. Well, it's, it's so interesting because when you talk about uncertainty, you know, generally people are thinking about how do we get it out of the system? And I've worked with a lot of really fantastic artists um, in my life, writers, poets, musicians, visual artists. And one of the things I've learned working with them is that every single thing about their life is uncertain. So, I mean, obviously, financially, it's a very uncertain thing, choosing to be an artist. The, um, the artist, Katie Patterson, told me, you know, that she was actually afraid to become an artist because she knew actually how difficult the life is. But that's almost, I mean, it's not the easy part, but that's the kind of obvious part. You know, when you start to create a work of art, however much you think you know what you're doing, you really don't. You don't know where the next word or the next brush stroke or the next note is going to take you. And all artists talk about this. Um, Tracy Evans says that sometimes she's so afraid to start a painting that she has to kind of do a lot of sketching to kind of work her nerve up, if you like. And when artists start painting a painting, they don't know what it's going to look like. So this is uncertainty at every single stage. Even fantastic printmakers like Norman Aykroyd never quite know what the print's going to look like because of course he's drawn the whole thing backwards in effect in a kind of mirror image because that's how prints are made. Um, novelists like Sebastian Barry said to me, you know, the thing about being a novelist is at any point something else could happen. So, but that's done, the fact that they don't have a plan doesn't stop them from beginning. They've kind of got to begin it. And of course they don't know when they begin it. Is this going to be a wonderful painting, an incredibly successful piece of music, or is it gonna be a complete and abject flop? So there are no reassurances and there are no guarantees and yet they keep going. And typically works take them where they didn't anticipate. I mean, Sebastian Barry told me one of the most heart stopping stories, which is his most recent, his uh, book before last. He spent nine months working on the first chapter and then got up one morning and threw the whole thing out except for one sentence. I can't, I can't believe how heart stopping that must have been. But what he said is he found a new style, a new tone of voice, and suddenly he was off, you know, he had something new and different to do in a new and different way. Um, so there's always that sense that actually, you know, it could be the wrong style, it could be the wrong subject, it could be the wrong story. But the only way you can possibly know is to do it. And when it's done, of course, you know, famously, pretty much everyone thinks, well, that really wasn't that really wasn't what I wanted to do. <laughs> um, you know, and that's really regardless whether it's successful or not. There's a sense that, well, now I've written that book, I really know how it should have been. So now I want to write the next one. And so you keep going. And you keep going without any certainty at all. And I just think that, you know, people so often infantilize artists because their work looks like play but it is the toughest work I've ever seen. I remember years ago, I sat on the board of the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, and it's a mixture of um, you know, actors, directors, writers, and business people. And it was really fascinating because the business people were really kind of shy um, in their contributions at the board meetings because essentially they didn't want to upset the artists around the table. And I remember saying to one of them, you know, who was a really kind of big, tall, tough corporate banker, I said, you have no idea how tough it is to be an artist. You know, the people around the table that you're handling like they're fragile, these are the toughest people. 
on earth. And you owe them the truth because that's the business that they're in, kind of. So I just think there's a lot we could learn about the mindset that allows people to start from scratch, working on something they may not see the end of, but who keep going despite, you know, an absence of a claim or guarantees or whatever. And I think, you know, this, this comes back specifically to thinking about the future, which is if we were thinking, trying to think about the future as artists, instead of insurance salesmen, we'd have a lot more interesting options in front of us. Oh, that. By the way, it's quite interesting because um, one of my editors wanted me to drop this chapter. <laughs> he just couldn't see that it was relevant, you know. Now that was partly my fault. I needed to spell it out more clearly, but I just thought, you know, that was kind of part of the problem. We still have this belief that we can plan everything and that's how we get to where we'll be successful but if you can plan it that minutely you aren't doing anything very personal or very interesting and the you know so the all the thing i i often tease some of my friends about you know they decide they're going to go somewhere new let's say they've never been to barcelona before so they do all the research as to what are the key sites and museums and they book the tickets and they book the best hotel and they book tables in the best restaurants and they download the you know the most scenic walks on their phones and so on and i often say to them what's the point of going you've done it all now because you've actually boxed yourself in with all of this research what they find really uncomfortable and I find this sometimes, you know, on holiday with friends is let's walk out to the front door and just wander around. Let's see. Let's see what we find. You know, let's actually do our own discovery. And I'm just astounded by the way to, in which that sort of, we might waste time. We might miss something. Yeah, but otherwise you're just seeing the same Barcelona that millions of other tourists are seeing. So you could actually see all of that at home. It's, it's um, amazing and amazing, uh, amazing part of your work, Margaret. It really is. And um, you know, the response has been brilliant. Rachel, that's such a fantastic way to put it. Jemima, so interesting. Thank you. Um, Marla, I love this concept of artists not knowing where things are going, but yet they carry on. Margaret has the best insight. Artists are tough. Love how she thinks so counterintuitively and challenging this thinking way in business. And um, I want to go back to Jemima, who says, you know, please, you know, can you just tell me how can I be useful as a dancer right now? I'm pretty down. Mm. And I, I don't know which way you want to go with that. I mean, is it do you think that, you know, cathedral thinking is a way that, you know, uh, that um, artists can begin to see how to think, uh, you know, how, how people can think more like artists or mm. or do you think? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, one thing I would say is. It's very rare to be an artist who can do only one thing. Um, and so I guess, I mean, I know nothing about dance really, but, but I'm just kind of working from what I know about many artists. Um, I would say two things. I would say, I'm sure that there are other things at this moment, um, which is her name, was her name Maya? Jemima. Jemima, um, which Jemima, has done in life that she really enjoyed. And she should try to remember what those are and think about how accessible those might be right now. Um, it's interesting, I was talking to somebody yesterday whose wife was doing an online ballet class. I can't even imagine how that works, but Jemima might be able to understand how that works. And actually now I'm just thinking about it, You know, why have I never done any dance? Well, I used to when I was younger but I wouldn't now because I'd be so embarrassed of how completely clunky and unfit I am, which means actually doing it online might be tolerable in a way that doing it in a studio would be with other people would be totally intolerable. But the other thing I'd say is, you know, you can also approach the problem obliquely and um, bear with me for a somewhat long winded story. Um, so I remember talking to somebody at the Guildhall School of Music who told me of a student, I think a cello student, who was doing okay, but not brilliantly. And, you know, it's a very competitive business. And so her tutors thought, you know, really they had a duty of care to 
let her understand that probably at the rate she was going, she was not really going to cut it as a professional cellist. And so they gave her a huge amount of support and kind of coaching and so on to start thinking about other things she might do in life. And one, for some reason, she came up with an idea of an online business, which was quite exciting. So she started working on that. She was still at Guildhall, but they were just kind of trying to get her to open up her kind of horizons. So she, she set up this online business. It, were, it became quite successful, moderately successful. But what they noticed at Guildhall was that her cello playing got a lot better. And what they said to me was, you know, the thing is that often it's other things in life that make your own art suddenly more interesting and more vibrant. And many sports people have told me this too. You know, that actually never, you know, forget the 10,000 hours a day playing table tennis. You know, sometimes it's swimming or painting that's actually going to up your game. We understand, for example, in Harvard Medical School, when they found doctors were becoming, their student doctors were not very good diagnosticians. However much they kept kind of making them work on diagnostics, actually, it was studying art history and painting that improved their powers of observation. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that the thing you most love doing, which for Jemima may well be dancing, don't think of doing other things as taking away from it because you may find it really enhances it. And that having more life to bring to your dance may make your dance much more eloquent, articulate, and powerful when you're able to return to it. Oh, thank you, Margaret. And I really appreciate that. And thank you, Jemima. Uh, lots of love to you. Um, and um, Jemima has actually done some incredible stretches for us on our as part of oh, our great. digital offering, where she formed them when she was on tour with the Can Do, um, Can Do Theatre Dance Group, where she's doing stretches for people who go to literary festivals. So that if you're talk, going to lots of the talks, go and see Jemima's videos and have a stretch between talks. Um, I might do that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, I guess one of the big questions that we're looking at uh, in also, and I, I wanted to ask you because you you speak to the minds of business leaders all the time, and I, you know, I think I think of also as having a huge amount of soft power, but we're not very establishment. Few of us are, but not many, you know. And I just wanted to talk. A lot of our speakers are saying that it has to be systematic change, system systematic change. That you know, we really have to see a huge amount of change at governmental level, and we're really exploring that, but. Is, is it possible as one person, as a consumer, as someone who interacts with business, as a consumer, to change business from our practices? Um, yes and no. I think working alone, um, the answer is probably no. I mean, I'm not saying you shouldn't, you know, buy the right stuff and, you know, not buy the crap at, at uh, Primark and so on. Um, I think all that stuff really matters. I don't think it's enough. And, and I've been thinking about this a long time, you know, just because, because of my own deep unease at, um, at our failure to deal with climate change. So the way I think about it increasingly is, um, I think of it as a sort of Venn diagram and the, with three circles. So one of the circles is where is their need? You know, where is their uh, need to move faster? And the second circle is, what do I have a passion for? And the third circle is resources. What are my resources? So in my case, you know, my resources are often um, uh, knowing quite a lot of people, having a lot access to a lot of information, um, being pretty well read. Um, I have a real passion for um, local collaborative work. And I think there's a huge need for communities to start taking responsibility for their own environmental impact, which is not to say that government is important. It is absolutely important. Global agreements are absolutely important and so on. But I can't stand the notion that we just have to sit by and wait for the big guys, you know, a million miles from here to figure it out because they haven't done so, so far. 
so, you know, in my Venn diagram, I thought, okay, so what could I do to add more impact to stuff that is happening locally? So I became a parish counselor. Um, you know, in our village, we've declared a climate emergency. We're doing a lot to inform everybody in the village about um, greener ways to live. We started thinking about all the things that can be recycled that the council doesn't recycle. So none of this is earth shattering and none of it's gonna be enough, um, but it has several positive outcomes. One is it's definitely created greater social cohesion within the village. Um, it's definitely led to, you know, a, a somewhat greener ecology for our village. And the third thing, which it is not trivial to me, is it stopped me being so angry and depressed all the time. And it means that I've met all sorts of people I would never have met otherwise, so I'm better informed. And so we're all becoming better informed. And of course, one of the things we discovered is lots of other people in neighboring villages were doing this, and we never knew. Right? And they never knew us. So, so I think the key thing is it's not enough to do it individually. You have to reach out and find other people who care about the same stuff and think, okay, what can we do together? And then when you've gone down that, you know, well, what other groups can we link in with? And that is on top of, of course, kind of driving protests and demands for much greater pace at a national level. But I think it kind of doesn't matter at what level you can intervene. I think it only matters that you do something. And I think that my observation is that lots of people feel very paralyzed because they can't see an immediate path from where I am to a gigantic impact. But you see those paths when you start working with others. And it's funny because um, titles are always a huge bugbear with books. Um, and at one point I was going to call the Uncharted, I was going to call that The Path is Made by Walking, which my publishers didn't like because it just sounded way too poetic. Um, <laughs> but I do really believe this, that you can't think your way to the solution. You have to get out and get working with other people. And then you start to make the path as you work with them. But you can't figure it all out in abstract, sitting alone indoors. Yeah, I think, you know, I, 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 I saw um, the, you're a big fan of citizen assemblies as well. Mm. Uh, you know, and we're beginning to see this again and again as sort of like something that just seemed to be a kind of nice way step between being individual not being able to or not being so um kind of defeated by what you can achieve at a governmental or a huge level you know they yeah. are beginning to see these paths opening up that um that we can uh we can use um and i think you know i think we've made a we made a, a complacent smug mistake in thinking well democracy is so great it doesn't need to evolve it's sort of perfect because actually, I think we all knew it was perfect. No, one's, no human system is perfect. And, you know, so we're now we're hearing a lot of cynicism around democracy. And I think, well, that's just childish. You know, the fact that our democracy doesn't work perfectly is no reason to give up on it, although clearly authoritarians would love nothing more. Um, if, our, if our democracy isn't perfect, then we have to work on it. We have to fix it. We have to invent and innovate, just like every other kind of thing in life, you know, needs a constant refresh. And, you know, I've even started talking to companies about how they could use the processes of citizens assemblies to have a much better idea of what the communities they serve want from them. Because business leaders are paid to make good decisions, but how do they know what's good for whom? And most of them are too isolated, honestly, to have anything but generalizations in their heads. So I think there is a real need at the moment to facilitate much more, you know, personal dialogue between different parts of our society. You know, we are as polarized as we are because we don't talk to each other. And as, as you know, Helen, you know, I made this program about um, can I change your mind? Because I think there's this very dangerous myth out there that people never change their minds. And it's absolutely categorically measurably not true. What changes people's minds is understanding the lived experiences of people not like themselves. 
And so we need to be in a position where we create more opportunities where that can happen. And it's really interesting because I, I had an experience exactly like that the last time I went to also, whereas I did what was for me a very scary session because it was brand new, um, challenging the notion of, of the power of narrative and how actually narratives trap us. And, and we think that the stories always work out in certain ways and they, and they absolutely don't. And uh, afterwards, walking away from the tent, I had this fantastic conversation with a woman who said, you know, you really made me change my mind about the way that I've been responding to my daughter coming out as gay. And I, at first, I absolutely could not see the connection here, you know, but we had this long, very personal conversation. It was incredibly moving. I will never forget it. But, you know, given a reframe, she'd been thinking actually the way she'd responded was wrong and not fair or kind to her daughter. And so I just, you know, I think we throw away things because they're imperfect instead of thinking, well, if they do something for us, let's just try and make them even better. Oh, thank you, Margaret. And in terms of uh, how to map the future, for all the reasons in your book and all the examples you give and all the many ways that you give us in your book in to be able to think about the future in different ways that are more beneficial, more sustainable, more useful, are you hopeful? Yes, I am hopeful. I mean, it is an optimistic book. Um, and it's optimistic for, for two reasons, really. One is because I am an, a, just a kind of incorrigible optimist. Um, but the other is because I, th I think this is going to sound terribly pretentious, so I apologize in advance, but I think we have a kind of moral obligation to be optimistic. I don't, I don't think we have the right to give up on future generations. I think we have an obligation to keep looking for better and better ways to do the things that you know, make people's lives meaningful and sustainable. And I think it's kind of lazy and cowardly to kind of wallow in dystopian futures instead of thinking, yeah, well, that's quite possible. It's quite possible. What have we got? What can we do now? Where are we? What can we start making that's better tomorrow than what we have today? Yeah. And I just, I just don't see any other way to get out of bed in the morning. <laughs> oh, you know, Margaret, if I could put a kind of if I could bring all the also in salon community together and say, what do we share? I think a moral obligation to be optimistic is probably one of the things we really share. It, yeah. you know, it underpins all everything that we do and everyone we work with. Thank you so much for giving your time. I know how incredibly busy you are and um, we so appreciate it. It's just been so lovely to see your face and to talk to you and have you as part as I think we're the first the first UK festival to try and deliver everything online. We're tiny, you know it. We have no resource and, you know, we've just done it and we will learn and then we'll do it better. Yeah. But um, And I think that's a fantastic image for what all of us have to be doing now, which is, you know, stop moaning about what we've lost and start thinking about what can we do with what we've got because you know human beings are phenomenally creative and ingenious and um and some of the stuff we've lost we probably needed to chuck overboard anyway <laughs> but anyway thank you so much as, as always a fantastic conversation as always, we could talk and, you know, and all the people listening and watching, we could all have a conversation from now till doomsday, you know, <laughs> well, thank and it's just, um, you know, it's just a joy. And I so appreciate the, your, and, you know, your really constant support for my work because, you know, some of it's pretty uphill sometimes. So thank you. <laughs> we love it, Margaret. We love your work. We love you. And we're so glad you've been part of this. And we very much look forward to doing it socially distant in a field at some point soon thank you margaret well i'll work on my bike riding because it could be quite a long cycle ride from here to also but you never know stretch challenge stretch challenge <laughs> perhaps i better start now <laughs> um thank you margaret thank you okay so <laughs> enjoy the rest of the day thank Cheers. you okay bye
Thank you so much for being part of Margaret Heffernan's Uncharted, How to Map the Future. Um, if you'd like a copy of her book, it is in our bookstore. We've got a bookshop on the, um, on our website. So um, please do buy from us, not from them. Um, Margaret is incredible and has been such a part of Also in Salon from the beginning. We're so lucky to um, have worked with her and have benefited so much from her ideas and experience. If she hadn't told Julia and I to start preparing back in February for doing this now, we couldn't have done it. So it, it really, it, <laughs> it really is something. Anyway, Dick and his family, I have to go. Thank you so much. This salon is now closed. <laughs>